Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. And there are days we don't feel it. There are days we think you're actually not good, and we blame you for our circumstances, and sometimes we even scream, what the heck are you doing, God? And that's how we feel. But when things come right down to it, and we come to our senses, we still get to see you are good, even in our pain. You're not absent from it. You're right in the thick of it. In fact, you're the one holding us up in it. And we can't even hold ourselves up in it. This morning, I pray for your peace in many people's lives, those that are struggling with difficulties, personal relationships, businesses crumbling, loss of job, you name it. Father, will you be their peace? And in such a way that they actually can, ex can experience it. Make it real. We pray for Melissa, that you help her migraine to go away, that she can be restored. I pray for Tanya, that the whole pregnancy thing will work out well, that happy and healthy baby will be born really soon. We pray for those generators to show up for Javier. Really, really, really. Uh, do a miracle for them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last couple of weeks have been uh, rather interesting. Uh, last week we had Steve McVeigh here sharing from his heart, and uh, he talked about the Word of God, capital W, versus the Word of God, the Bible. And that was a really, really good message, uh, kind of reminding us that uh, Jesus himself is the true Word of God. And then he began to describe the Trinity and the power and love of the perichoresis, the circle dance of the three-in-one. And the week before that, we talked about the gospel. What is the gospel? We showed it through a display of chairs and how we can sometimes have a really bad misunderstanding of who we think God is, and it shapes our perspective of him. Whatever we believe about God, we will act just like that belief. Every single one of us. If we think he is distant, if, he, if we think he is um, making bad stuff happen to us in order to grow us, if we believe that, then we're going to live that out in a morbid fear. But if we can dig deeper into discovering who the Father is, who the Son is, who the Holy Spirit is, and they are perfect love, three in one, maybe then we can begin to trust and throw our trust towards our Heavenly Father even in the middle of our rough circumstances. In the Trinity is perfect relationship. And with that in mind, I always say life is about relationships. I'm usually referring to the greatest relationship, but it works itself out in our personal relationships as well. Today I want to continue in revealing more of what I call the gospel, the good news. And that might mean reshaping our thinking of seeing who God is and how he impacts our world. And I'm going to let the scripture do it. I'm going to let the Bible tell us and speak to us what he could be saying, how I perceive God to be. The changes that I've gone through, um, the last number of years have been wild. And the love of God just is getting bigger and better. God's looking better to me all the time. That's crazy because... <laughs> Well, growing up, you know, God is so good. We sang that song, right? This very, God is so good. He's so good. Isn't that nice? He's good. That's great. Okay. But then real stuff happens. Is he still good in that? Well, circumstantially, we don't always see that. We don't remember his goodness. So let's dig in. The gospel. The light is in all. This was one of the biggest revelations to me about six years ago. Six years ago, I've been really struggling with, okay, what did Jesus really accomplish at the cross? What am I not seeing about this God I say I believe in? You see, I grew up in church. I went to Sunday school. In fact, my father was my Sunday school teacher for a time. So I had to learn all the Bible stories. I went through that whole thing where you get these pencils with Bible verses on it, and you get these pencil sharpeners with the smiley Jesus loves you, and then if you memorize enough stuff, you get to win contests, and you get even bigger cool stuff with Jesus stuff plastered all over it, all that corny Jesus junk, 
the stuff they sell in Christian bookstores, which is, okay, if that's what you have to do. But that's the churchianity culture. Everybody else looks at it and goes, are you kidding? Really? If you're not a believer, you look at that and go, like, I don't even understand you guys. But if you're in it, you go, yeah, yeah, of course, this is evangelizing. If I, if I put all my Jesus stuff out, people will see the love of Jesus. And if I put a bumper sticker on my car, then, first of all, you have to drive nice. But then they'll see that you're like one of those Jesus guys, you know, and then honk you for love of Jesus. But really, they're honking at you because you don't know how to drive. Who knows? All that paraphernalia that I think distracts us from the true God. I don't think we need to have stickers or t-shirts or anything like that in order to allow the life of Christ in us to come out. Some of those things are fun, and it's, it's great. But when that becomes your method, which is what it was for me growing up in the church I grew up in, it was all about what you did, how many people you invited to church, and you got check marks and, and stars beside your name for every friend, and you get rewarded for that. Huh, performance-based acceptance. That's what I learned. That's where I grew up. And because that's what the church was teaching me, I also believed that must be true between my Heavenly Father and me. I didn't realize it. I didn't make that bridge. But as I'm older now, looking back, I'm thinking, wow, I never caught that, that I was believing God was like that. Well, I also thought there was us versus them. I thought God was way out there and that God was distant separated from me. And I've come to a new conclusion over the last several years. God is not separated from us. It's an absolute impossibility. What does that mean? Well, at the very beginning when I started learning this, I thought, well, does that mean everybody's saved and going to heaven? They don't have to even think or believe or anything like that. And so I was in attention. Well, if that's true, then that must be true. And I, it was a very, very difficult time just trying to understand the scriptures. But with what I want to share with you today, and I probably will head into next week, I want to share with you a foundation that has radically changed my perspective on understanding the scriptures and understanding God. So the little Sunday school workbooks that we had, because there's a thing called curriculum, and we use it here too. We take the kids through and teach children what the Bible stories are, some concepts of God, and, and talk about the love of God and the forgiveness of God, and those are good things. Okay, that, that, those, those things are really important. But it packages God into a box in a sense. God is not in a box. What if... And answer this one yourself. Don't put your hand up and don't say it out loud. What if God is even bigger than you think right now? From your current concept of God, could he be bigger and better than you've dreamed of? Is it possible he's bigger than your concept of him right now, no matter where you are in your faith? Is it possible? That's an important question to answer. Because if you don't see that it is possible, you're not going to get this. None of us have arrived. None of us, no denomination, no church has the answer for understanding who God is. Okay? None of us. Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Presbyterian, Catholic, you name it. None of, no one group has it. 33,000 denominations can't all be wrong, can they? Today I'd like to share with you a picture of how I see God working actively in all humanity. And hope I get to accomplish it today. And if I don't, it will be accomplished by next week. It's, it's, if you saw many slides I have, you go, <laughs> yeah. And I remember the first time I taught this, I spoke so quick. I watched the video and went, how did anybody hear anything? So I want to slow down. I want to pick it apart and help you understand this. Here we go. Colossians 1, 5 to 17. And by the way, uh, you don't have to take notes. You can always go on to YouTube and check out the verses. They'll be plastered there. You can look them up. But I do encourage you, look this stuff up in your Bible. This is really, really important. Here we go. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Whew. Have you ever thought of that? 
Jesus is the image of his Father. He's not different. He is the image. The firstborn over all creation. Here's where it starts getting good. For by him, some things were created. Oops, no. Nope. For by him, all things were created. I grew up in Sinai school believing God created. God the Father was the one who created the world. That's, they didn't say that, but that's what I was led to believe. And yet, here we have Jesus is the one who was the one who created the world. Now, did they do it together? Yes. Great minds think alike. They're one. Okay, They're not absent from each other, but here the recognition is given to Jesus as the creator of all things. Name something not created by God. <laughs> you can't. Anything that exists has been created by Jesus. Things in heaven, interesting, and on earth. Visible and invisible, stuff you can't see. Whether thrones ooh, or dominions or rulers or authorities, <laughs> all things have been created through him and for him. Interesting. He is before all things, and in him all things are. Hold together. All things are held together by Christ. And this is where I challenge the whole idea of God being separated. Because if Christ has created all things, clearly he holds together every molecule in your body, every atom in every chair, in this building, the concrete, the screen, you name it. He holds all things together, therefore cannot be absent from anything except in your mind. There are many people separated from God in their mind. They don't believe he exists. They choose not to believe. They're darkened in their minds. We're going to talk about the light in a few minutes. But this foundation rocked my world that everything in all creation is held together by Christ. You see, that can change how you read the scriptures. Because it's easy to forget. If you think there's a chance you can be separated from God. A lot of fear in that. John 3, verse 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. In John 5.20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. Do you think it's trying to say the Father loves the Son? Yes. I gave an illustration a couple years ago. I don't want to do it again because I think it, the visual is really, really important. I'm going to get uh, Colleen and get both of you to come on up. Yeah, come on up. I know. Single you out. I need you guys to, to help me with an illustration. Can you handle it? Good. All right. Now, who wants to be God the Father? <laughs> Me. Okay. Oh, control freak. All right. No, I'm just kidding. That's great. God the Father, I'm going to make you Jesus. And you're going to be the Holy Spirit. And the reason she's the Holy Spirit, get this. If you were here last week, if not, go back and listen to it. The Holy Spirit is referred to in the, in the female gender sense, in the term, in that, in that picture throughout the entire Old Testament. Not male. Female. Is God either gender? No, he is not. He is spirit. But the definitions that are used to describe him and her, <laughs> Holy Spirit is more feminine in most circumstances throughout the scriptures. You look it up yourself, it's not a hard find. So, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father. Now, we just finished reading. Father, does the Father love the Son? Yeah, so I'm going to get you to put your hand on his shoulder. Just like that. Isn't that nice? It's almost like you guys are together. Oh, brother. Now, does the Son love the Father? Work with me, people. Come on. It's going to be a long message if you don't hurry up. 
Yeah, so put your hand on her shoulder, same way. Not neck, not arm, shoulder, right on, just like that, because I, I, need, you, I need room. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, just kind of spread out a little. Does the son love the spirit? Yes. yes, so hand on shoulder. Does the spirit love the son? Yes. yes. Does the son, or sorry, spirit love the father? Yes. yes. And the father loves the spirit. This is called the Trinity. <coughs> this is it. This exists right now, and it does not need us to sustain itself. It has everything it needs. God did not create us. Oh, we're lonely. We need, we need some more people. He didn't do that. His love was so big because in the middle of this, what's called perichoresis, that's what the early church called the Trinity. Peri's perimeter, creases is choreographed. It's a dance. The dancing God. Seriously, like, who thinks like that? Not my Baptist days. No way. That's a <laughs> bad image. And yet it's the most biblical one. And where's humanity in all this? And God, having so much love, had to give even more of it away. Dawn, come on up. Dawn represents you and I, humanity. And where is humanity? He knows exactly where it is. Watch where he goes. He is going to go to the right place. Oh, how did he know that? Oh, my goodness. You are included in the love of the Trinity. Thank you. That's good. This is what I get to tell people now. People who feel alone, rejected, hurt, suicidal, in horrific relationships, and they come asking, hey, where is this God of love? And I can say, you are in his love. You're not separated from it, but you might be blind to it. You're included in his love. Now believe it. Because when you believe it, you will experience a huge joy and a life change. If you choose not to believe it, you continue to walk in darkness. We have all been included in his love. The Trinity is a critically important doctrine. It is n the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the doctrine of the Trinity is clearly blatant all through. It's beautiful. Click. Are you, can I have the clicker? Dumb. Dumb. There we go. Is that it? Good. John 14, 8 to 11 says this. Lord, show us the Father. And we'll be satisfied, you know? He's been kind of secret and hiding all his centuries. And in the Old Testament, he's been kind of hidden by a cloud or something, and nobody's seen him. So show us the Father. Because, you know, we are tight. We're a, we're a group here. You invited us into your little 12. Show us the Father. That'd be, that's God. I got it. Now, has anybody here ever done this prayer? Father, if you just show me an angel, I'll believe. Just show me a little miracle. Make that thing move and I'll believe, or, or make that happen, and oh, that's it, I'll totally surrender. Anybody ever, ever do that? How many are lying? Man, fine, maybe I'm, it's the way I grew up, I just, I wanted more of. So anyway, Philip says, show us the Father, and here's how Jesus replies, and I believe this is one of the most pivotal parts in the entire scripture. This is it. You get this, you're going to get the Trinity. You're going to get the Father. Listen, Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. <laughs> There's something consistent here. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Holy smokes, did you catch that? Did you get the double in? How does that work anyway? Perichoresis. That's how. They're in each other. They are one. They're in union with each other. This is your daddy. This is your Jesus. This is your spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. The words I speak are not my own. But my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Oh my goodness, wait a minute. I thought we had to do work for Jesus. 
I thought we had to do work for God in order to stay right and stay loved. But here, Jesus wrecks it. He wrecks the what would Jesus do thing. It's gone. I think if I saw a hilarious comedian this week on video. He said, did you know Jesus had a brother, James? Can you, can you imagine the life that, that poor James had? Mother said, James, why can't you be more like Jesus? You know, like, and all those things, you know, were the funniest part I thought was great. I forget his name. So if you remember his name, tell me who it is. Um, uh, um, he said he's at a, he goes to a second wedding, and Jesus didn't go to that one. And they run out of wine. And they're all staring at James. Yeah? So you can't imagine the pressure for being a kid. Oh, man. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to look it up. It's a really funny one. Here's what happens. Jesus chose to live out of his father, not his, his divinity. He was fully God and fully man. And he knew who his father was. He didn't have to do work for God. God did the work in and through Jesus. It says in Acts, it was God, the Father, who performed the miracles through Jesus. Not the man Jesus, it was the Father doing it. Huh. That's called perfect abiding. Jesus abided in the Father. He recognized who dwelled in him. And imagine what would happen for all of us if we moment by moment recognized, instant by instant, who dwells in us. If I can say it in a funny way, you're possessed. <laughs> by whom? <laughs> Jesus. Now let him out. Let him animate himself through you. That's the beauty of our oneness with Christ. Just like the Father is one with the Son and one with the Spirit, they're all one. We too are one with Him. That's the great mystery. Colossians 1.27. Here's the secret. Christ lives in you. Let that sink in. I always thought he was out there, and he popped in and out based on my behavior. When I'm good, he's all cuddly. When I'm bad, because he can't handle sin, he's got to turn his back. That's what I thought. Well, that's an absolute lie. An impossibility. He pursues us, especially when we're in our darkness and not believing things. The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because the work you've seen me do. Seriously, people. <laughs> I don't think he had the sarcasm there. He really meant it. He was saying, please believe. That's big. I want you to see a better picture of the Heavenly Father than what our movies and what the church has taught us, the Western church or the legalistic church. The bride of Christ, the church, you and me, God has been speaking to and through for centuries. And it's a consistent message. I think we've jumped the tracks at times and we need to be brought back to a Christocentric understanding of the scriptures and of who the Trinity is. Christ-centered. John 1. This is amazing stuff. I've talked about this one before, but this is building the case for a better gospel, a better picture of who we see the Father to be. Because you might be saying, well, how does this apply to my everyday life? Aren't you supposed to give us practical lessons on how to parent, how to raise kids, how to go to school better, how to do your jobs, how to forgive one? What about those practical things? This is the foundation for all that stuff. You don't get this right. All the other stuff does not come out right. It's just a fact. In the beginning. That's the first time baseball is mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> was the word, capital W, Jesus. And the word was with God. And the Word was God. There's a reason John is writing like this. 
Of all the Gospels, this is the only relationally intense one. The other ones are story. Laying out, here's what's happened. A to B, B to C, C to D, blah, 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 blah. And a couple of things that were said. This is the relational one. This is the grand slam of the four. Bases are loaded. John hits. This is critical. In the beginning was the word. I didn't even mean the baseball joke for up there. But anyway, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He has always been. There's never been a time he hasn't been. All things came into being through him. There it is again. Another affirmation of everything coming through Christ. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Do you think he's trying to make a point? Do you see the, uh, uh, the double? <laughs> Gotta get it. In him was life. And the life was here it is, the light of men. Light and life. I want you to listen carefully over the next 15 minutes. The words light and life and how they fit. Light is the primary word. Okay, critical. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. This blew my mind five years ago, six years ago. When I saw what the light does, that it shines in and through darkness. If I use this laser pointer, um, am I shining through the screen? What am I doing? Shining on the screen. That's different. I can shine this at all. Anybody here and it shines on them or hits them, but never penetrates and goes through. The light, which is the life of Christ, the light shines through darkness. And it's the light of man. It shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. What does that mean, comprehend it? It doesn't perceive it. Here's a definition from the uh, New American Standard Bible, uh, the Greek lexicon. To comprehend, to lay hold of, so as to make one's own, to obtain to attain to, to make one's own, blah, 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 you get that point. To seize upon, to take possession of, in a good sense of Christ by his holy power, influence, laying hold of the human mind and will in order to prompt and govern it, to detect, to catch, to lay hold of with the mind, to understand, perceive, learn, comprehend. The darkness did not comprehend, perceive, catch it. It just, what? I don't see nothing. And yet the light shines through since Christ holds all things together, I believe his light shines through all things and everyone, everything. Those who perceive it see light. Those who do not see darkness. Let's keep going from John. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. This is not the author. This is John the Baptist they're talking about. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. See the capitals? It's really important. That's Jesus. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every person who says the prayer. It does not say that. It enlightens every man, woman, child. Does that mean everybody's a believer? No. Please don't run ahead to that. That's churchianity making you fit this truth into a box because we have to have our boxes all clear and they can't touch and they can't, they, they, you know what I mean? Like, Sorry, the more I grew on grace, the boxes are falling apart. And it's, whoa, I can't even organize all this now. It's hard. Enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. 
He came to his son, oh, sorry, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him, coming to Israel. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. Huh? Think about that. I'm not going to tell you what it means. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. I believe we are all children of God. He created all of us. I'll show that to you in a few minutes. There's, I'm not making this stuff up. Let the scripture be clear. I'm highlighting things that were not pointed out to me growing up. Even in Bible college, I had to fit those cubbies. I had to fit that theological chapter, and, and it always goes by the interpretation of the one who wrote that chapter. Everything's got an interpretation. Even our translations. After all, what language was Scripture written in? Three languages. Anybody know? Greek, Greek New Testament, and Arabic, and, uh, of course, Hebrew. Those are the primary languages. We do not have the original texts. There might be a reason for that. Let's keep going. Acts 17, 28. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And here he's standing in front of a whole bunch of non-believers. This is important. In fact, they're worshiping all these gods, and there's statues everywhere of all kinds of gods they worship, small g. And then there was one called to an unknown God, because we probably missed one. <laughs> That's probably what it was. And Paul comes and says, ah, I'm going to tell you about that one. Do you know what he does? He ends up quoting, can, can you believe this? In our scripture, we have a quote from a pagan deity. For in him we live and move and exist even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. This is a Zeus quote in your Bible. <laughs> Paul is saying, look, all of creation is held together by Christ. We all exist in Christ. You're already in Christ. That does not make you a believer. But it makes you in it makes you held together by him. You're not separated from him. Open your eyes and see the light that's shining through you. Will you respond to that light? We're all his children. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For it was the Father's good, Father God's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him, listen to this, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, to reconcile all things to himself. How many times have you and I put verses aside? I don't get that one right now. It doesn't fit my, my cubby hole. Well, I'm trying to highlight some of those verses we've not tackled and need to answer, even if it's uncomfortable, even if we don't come up with an answer. But this is what it says, to reconcile all things to himself. And where did it happen? And it happened not because of a prayer, not because of anything you've done. It happened, he made peace through the blood of his cross. It happened at the cross. That's where all things were reconciled. That's big. All things, not some. Not because of your good works and your nice prayer and the properly scripted little thingy you've decided. I decided. You decided what? I've invited Jesus into my life. Oh, really? How did that work? It's backwards. He's included you in his. It's very different. Now believe it. 
The moment I prayed as a seven-year-old, Jesus, please come into my heart, the words weren't the issue. Right or wrong, who cares? Do they have value? Yes. It's a demonstration of my faith coming out of my mouth. You can say those words. It's fine. Don't correct everybody on that. Instead, it's a moment of faith declaring what they are now believing. That is a moment of Christian faith where a person becomes a Christian. That's powerful. That's what we're asking people to do. Believe this good news. Declare the good news, but it better be good news. Not potential good news. It has to be good news already. Romans 5, 8 to 10. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, everybody, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did Christ die for us? It's important. Did he do it when we were believing? Or is it long before our belief? Before. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have, he didn't ask your permission. Can, can, I, can I die for you? Can you sign here? Because, you know, insurance reasons. Christ died for us. Much more than, this is where God gets, has got to get bigger than your paradigm. Including mine that I have today. I've not arrived. I want to grow. I want to see God bigger and better than I see him now. I've got a lot of questions. In fact, I think I have more questions now in the last five years than I ever have. And I'm good with that. I don't have to be the answer man. It takes a lot of pressure off. Much more than having now been justified, having now been, having now been, having now been. So not only are we reconciled, we're also justified. This Christmas gift is bigger than you think. Christ, Christ, mass gift. Hope you get it. By his blood, this is how it happened. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Does anybody have a King James Bible here? Who's got a King James Bible? Okay, look this up online. Any interlinear Bible that shows you the Greek and shows you the English translation, interlinear is what you want to look up. These two words aren't there. Shall be. It's just not there. So, if while we were sinners, Christ did all this stuff for us, reconciled us and justified us, while we were still sinners, and while we were still enemies, by the way, enemy is one-sided. I can be enemies with Colleen, and I can see her as an enemy of mine, but she may not have any animosity towards me at all. But I think so, therefore she's an enemy of mine. It's one-sided. Look it up in your dictionaries. While we were enemies of God... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. The reconciliation happened at the cross. This gift just got bigger, and you had no part in it. In fact, you were still a sinner, and you were an enemy in your mind. Can, can you see the wow factor of what just happened now? Let's keep going. Romans 5.11. And not only this... But we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. King James, by whom we have now received the atonement. At one meant. Atonement. At one meant. We have been made one with Christ. This is beautiful. This is the gospel. It's bigger than I thought. It may even be uncomfortable. Say, well, now I've got to ask some questions about what I've believed and how I've perceived certain scriptures. Well, I'm going to give you ones for you to look up, go and reconcile these to your beliefs. 
2 Corinthians 5.19. For God was, where? In Christ, reconciling the world to himself, which was where? According to time and space, when did that happen? When did Christ reconcile the world to himself? Where, when God was in Christ, where did it happen? At the cross, that's easy. So where was God? In Christ, not absent, not turning his back. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've talked about this before. A couple things could be happening. One, he's in his darkness and he's feeling alone. God, where are you? Number two, he's quoting Psalm 22, which is the entire messianic psalm, describing in great detail, even the casting of lots of clothes, everything that was happening at that moment, Jesus could have been declaring, this is it. This is the time in history. could also be being fully human and going through pain and suffering, just like we are, identifying with our pain. There's lots of ways to see it, but God did not turn his back because in Psalm 22, it still says, and yet I will not turn my back. It's good news. You can trust your heavenly father. He will never turn his back on you. He can't. You're connected. Reconciliation. What is it? From the Latin, reconciliantio, which is like a, um, a pasta from Italy. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a reestablishing, reinstatement, restoration, renewal, a reconciling reconciliation. It also means this, to reconcile, to recreate friend relationships. What happened in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned? When God walked into the garden, did he know fully what they had done? Yes. And he still went in. So this idea, God's too holy to look at sin, he runs to that. Hey, Adam and Eve, where are you hiding, guys? I don't know fully what you've done, but I don't reject you. Where are you? But they were blind, and the relationship was in a bad place. And God took that and reconciled the relationship that went sour and has now reestablished it to make things compatible or consistent. And he did it through the cross to make the net difference in credits and debits of financial account agree with the balance. So if we, if we, our forgiveness was part of this. When you go to your bank and you, you wrote about 20 checks, you want to make sure all 20 checks equal $200 and then your bank says you've $200 came out. You reconcile the two. Yes, I agree. I'm asking you, will you reconcile a reconciliation in yourself? Will you take a look and answer this? Did it happen or not? Do you know what it'll do? It'll, it'll throw you into a trusting, more intimate connection with your Heavenly Father called Intimacy. You learn to live out of his resources already in you. Conciliation, the action of bringing peace and harmony. Huh, you a prince of peace, do you think so? He came. Did Jesus accomplish what he came to accomplish? Yes or no? Did he almost do it or did he fully do it? Which do you think? Fully. Okay, then let me ask you this question. If what Adam did in the garden by sinning, if his work did a disservice to us, the first Adam, is his work bigger or equal to or less than the work of Christ, what Christ did on the cross? If Adam caused the sin, would the work of Christ be at least equal to that? At least! But it says far more, even better. We have a limited understanding of what happened and the work Jesus came to do. It's good news. Yeah, but, but. You can have all the buts you want, and they're okay. We need to invite questions, not shun people from questions. And be honest when we don't have the, an answer. I've had a lot of people come and say, well, what about this and this? And now I'm starting to say, guys, how about you just jump onto the journey with me? I'll show you. Let, let the Holy Spirit guide you. I'm not going to rob you of your wrestling that I've had to wrestle for the last six to eight years. 
Don't rob people of that with unrefined, unfiltered answers. Point them to the scripture so they can look there themselves. That's why I'm showing you all these. So you can go home, you can look it up, you can come to your own conclusion. Whether you agree with me or not, you don't have to agree. But I want you to see God is bigger and better and his love is farther reaching than we've been told. And I like that. And I can trust that God more and more. Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and exist, and even as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. Colossians 3, 11, this is the last one for this morning. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free mean nothing. From now on, everyone, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. Look it up, Colossians 3.11, in your own translation. Every translation says it. If that's true, why is there a difference between believer and unbeliever? That's a great question. Because this does not make everybody a believer, does not make everybody a Christian. But the work of Christ has been done. And you're included. We have a better gospel to share. One that actually is good news for all of humanity. It's a whole lot easier to share this now. <laughs> we got to stop there. Next week we're going to finish up. There's at least another half to go. <laughs> it's a lot of slides. But there's a lot of great verses that kind of put this together. It's like, okay, this actually is saying what I think it's saying. And I'm not even trying to embellish anything. You can see it yourself. I hope so anyway. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we can put all the scriptures up on the screen we want. We can open our Bibles and read any text, all we want, and even memorize it fully. But we need your Holy Spirit to interpret, to confirm, to explain meaning to us, to confirm what we've heard or deny it, or find a better understanding. Father, will you grow us up? May we not be satisfied with the revelation we've been given, but hunger for more. And that hunger comes from your spirit in us, causing us to grow up. You've called all of us to grow up. Stop eating pablum and get into the meat and potatoes of the scriptures and of what your spirit wants to teach us. Bless each person here today. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your light, which shines in all creation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.